clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large. Spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. Make room for change. Have you ever had a window of time in your life where you thought it was set? That this is going to play out this way. Maybe happier than you've ever been, more at peace than you've ever been. Somehow, some way in your mind, you, you're certain of how this thing is going to play out. Nineteen eighty six had the best job I'd ever had. The most beautiful wife I'd ever had. It was the only one I ever had, but it was beautiful child. Probably as secure and set as I'd ever been. Thought I had it figured out. (laughs) Then God. I didn't know that when Jan got pregnant with Sydney, I was going to gain more weight than she did. She gained 22, I gained 27. She lost it faster than I did. Any men, can you say amen to not 27, but you gained as much weight? Almost? Yeah. I'd never gained weight like that. I'd had a weight problem as a kid. Uh, you know, one of those things when I was like sixth grade, and I used to brag about the fact that from the Lighthouse Drive-In, which is our little drive-in there in Wicks, Arkansas, I could eat two double cheeseburgers at one sitting at 12 years old. That was an accomplishment. Until back then, your summers were three months long. I mean, you're you're out of school, your summers, I guess summer's always three months long, but our out of school was three months long. We come back after Labor Day, and my little girlfriend that I had when I ended the sixth grade and I started the seventh grade, she wrote me a note through her friends and said, I can't be your girlfriend anymore because you've gained too much weight. I thought it was cool till then. But now here I am, 26 years old, and I have gained this weight and I've got to figure out how to way to get it off. So I go into this diet that I had figured out on my own to eat like six to seven hundred calories a day, and and then that run four to six miles a day. And man, I was I, I lost weight, I lost seventeen pounds in ten days. It was phenomenal. Except my body didn't like it. I didn't know that's what the problem was, but in the process of this time, Jan and I had started going to church. And uh, she had started, I, start, I followed her, and yeah, things were happening. Every time I went to church, I heard something like, wow, okay, this is awakening something in me that I didn't know before. Maybe somehow or another there's something sparking something I'd never thought about before. But hey, my life's good. So there's really no reason, there's no, there's no, I'm not like at the bottom. It's not like everything, I've hit rock bottom and I need to find an answer. That's not, that was not where I was. Matter of fact, everything was better than it had been in a decade. By far. But through this process of losing this weight, Jan and I went with some friends over to Idabel, Oklahoma to get a, my first recliner as a man, a man chair. Went to get that. Put it in the back of the truck. We were riding in a one bench pickup truck back then. No seat belts. Nobody had to do that back then. You didn't worry about that, right? Put four people in there and you just go. So we're riding back and they started talking about a friend of theirs that had a heart attack. And the more they talked about it, the more all of a sudden I was having a heart attack. The more they talked about it going up his arm, and I thought, boy, I feel it going up my arm. And all of a sudden, he he said his chest got tight, and my chest started getting tight. And finally, I was kind of panicking, and and I I said to to, uh, Gene, who was the couple we were with, I said, Gene, I think you need to drive me, and I think I'm having a heart attack. 
So we took off and we get to DeKalb, uh, uh, Texas, and we're, it's like an hour's drive from Texarkana, so we're hustling back. There's no hospital anywhere around. And so and then there's no EMTs back then. It's hard to imagine you couldn't just call 911, but we couldn't. So we stopped at a, a police station. He just said, you need to drive fast. That was his advice to us. So that was it. So we did. So we get to uh, I-30 and Highway 87 there in New Boston, Texas, exit 199. I'm freaking out. I'm telling Jan at that point. I said, Jan, I am dying, and I'm dying without Jesus, and I'm going to hell. This is a conversation we're having in a pickup truck with other people there. We're going up that on-ramp, and, of course, I, you've heard me say this before. Jan was saying, no, you're a good man. You're not going to go to hell. That was a lie. But she wanted to make me feel better in that moment that if I did die, I was okay, even though I wasn't. That moment, on that own ramp, I gave my life to Jesus. I did not know what was about to happen. I didn't know that I needed to be clearing ground. I didn't know in that moment about Paul's words in Acts chapter 20 where he had gone to Ephesus and he called the leaders there. Let's just skip on to verse 20. And Paul says, Every truth and encouragement that I could have that could have made a difference to you, you got. In other words, I've told you everything you need to know, man. I've been been telling you all the truths, whether you wanted to hear them or not, I've been telling you. But this is what he goes on to say. He said, But I taught you out in public and I taught you in your homes, urging Jews and Greeks alike to a radical life change before God in an equally trust in our Lord Jesus. What I did not know when I came, when I made that decision and I came to know Jesus, it was more than about now and having a new group of people to hang out with and new activities to do and places to go on Sunday and back then, Sunday night and Wednesday night. What I was called to was a radical life change. That's what I was called to. I wasn't called to join First Baptist Church in Hooks, Texas. I wasn't called to be a Baptist or a Nazarene or a Calvinist or a Wesleyan. I wasn't called to do any of those things. I was called to a radical life change. I didn't even know any Johns back then. John Wesley, John Calvin, John, any of that. I knew, though, that Jesus had come into my life even though my life was so good. I had security but no vision. I seem to have some kind of certainty, but really no clarity of the future. But he began to work on me to say, make room. If I ask you today, if this is a radical life change and things need to change, if I ask you right now, And you can't ask anybody else, what do you already know that needs to change in your life? You already know. You don't need to ask anybody else. You don't need to ask them. It's not change for change's sake. It's something that has been laid on your heart and in your mind that you know needs to happen. But the question I'm going to start out today, though, is the follow-up to that is, why haven't you already done it? I have a feeling other people already know it needs to happen. The question is, why has it not already happened? And I think the answer to that is, there's always a hard part. And the reason why I love the term radical life change that Paul uses there, or Eugene Peterson uses there in Acts 20, uh, Acts 17, uh, 20, 
21 is because it's, ra- it's radical because if it was easy, you would have already done it. As a father, man, I wish I'd have known all the hard parts. Sometimes you get thrown into it. Now, I didn't know when I had a baby, where our first baby, that obviously that, that uh, I was going to come to know the Lord through her, which I shared with you last week. I didn't know that was going to happen. What I didn't know, we were going to have three more. I didn't know all the things, but one thing I did get to know early, and when God began to take room up in my life, there began to come clarity of how they were supposed to be raised, whether I had one or I had four or I had ten. That became very clear to me. There was clarity but uncertainty. (laughs) Tons of uncertainty, but there was clarity. I mean, I didn't know when that happened. I just knew, follow after him, do the best you can to become like him, and I didn't know at that time I was going to have opportunities, one, to move to Arizona or anything else or be go around the world and take trips with people and lead people and lead hundreds if not thousands of teenagers along the way and young people. I didn't know I was going to have that. What I knew was was clarity where I needed to be headed. I knew the direction I needed to be going. I just didn't know all the pieces that went with it, but when I understood it, I tried to act into it. One of the hard parts often is I don't have certainty. Have you not lived the last two or three years in our country? If you're dependent on certainty, you're in trouble. Clarity is a different deal. What your values are, who you are, who you're following. See, sometimes I've heard this saying years ago, it really doesn't matter where you're going as long as you trust the one you're following. It really doesn't matter. I mean, when our kids were young, I don't know if we have that picture up there. Our kids, that's right before we moved to Arizona in 1997. I thought it was hard being a dad then. There were hard parts of that and decisions I had to make. But part of it was, though, I could also tell them, go to your room. Just go to your room. But then there's this part. That's sometimes harder. I don't have near the influence I had before. I don't have near the decision-making in their lives. Other people are influencing them. Some, some people along the way. I mean, it can happen overnight, right? You can be a father who's given them, and a mother who's given them shelter. Bought them books, sent them to school, as the old saying goes. Bought, helped them buy a car. You got insurance. You got all these things. But in one time, they meet one person, and now that person has more influence on them than you do. In that moment. I didn't know how to navigate those hard parts. Except for one thing. Clarity of where we're headed. We're going to continue to march here. This is who we're going to be as a family. You may choose not to follow the values of who we are, but we are going to continue to march here. I know what it's like. 2010, 2011, coming out of the crash, if you will. To have 700 and something dollars in our bank account as a family. Over our head in debt, just trying to make it through that two or three year season. Two kids in college, one in a private school. In a season of my occupation as a pastor at Crossroads, knowing that I was living into 100%, I've mentioned this other day, somebody, living into 100% of my job description, but they were only getting 50% of me because I couldn't live into the fullness of what God had called me to do, but God hadn't released me. But what I did know to do was keep walking. Clarity. This is where we're headed. I realize you want this, young lady. And I realize you're going to walk that way, young man. But we're walking here. 
with our changes we made along the way for each child to accommodate their personality and their mix and all that, you bet. Sure we did. We were willing to be open to that, but some things we were not changing. It's one of the hardest parts, I think, about being a parent. Is not being changed by the circumstances of what your kids want to do and where they want to go and even sometimes how they see the world. Because you know God's given you clarity of who you are, where you're headed, and you're not moving. There's a hard part. But the hard part of being a parent, too, is, as I said earlier, you let them go. And you pray this prayer as you... I've done with my kids. Lord, they're your girl. She's your girl. She's your daughter before she was mine. Lord, he's your son. I've got to take my hands off and let him go. That may be the hardest part. And Lord, I pray that you bring him back. I bring that you bring them back, but I'm letting them go. Well, I thought you were trying to control them. You were trying to set the agenda. But there's a point you got to change. Because you've done the best you can. You go, i got to let God do what only God can do. Because I can't do it anymore. I'm not changing in the sense of where we're headed. And who we're going to be as a family. But i got to let them go. Because God, she's your girl. She, he's your boy. And I don't know if any parent here has ever had to be there going, that may be the hardest part. Oh, not trying to pay for tuition or get them car insurance. And have My kids, my girls had 27 wrecks. Oh, that's not an exaggeration. Amen, Tori? 27 accidents. I never wanted to answer the phone. Dad. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I know what's coming next. 27. I think it was the number. I don't know. We counted up. It. It's a crazy number. That wasn't the hardest part. The hardest part is letting them go, knowing you no longer have control for protection. Leading a church. You know what the hardest part of leading a church is, I think? And you can say, well, it's raising enough money, and we will address that. It is hard. I think the hardest part about leading a church so often is knowing it's not for everybody. If you have a clear vision of where you believe God has got you going and you're headed, you have to come to the conclusion it is not for everybody. Jesus is for everybody. (laughs) That's a fact. Renovation just may not be for everybody. It may be the hardest part. I think it's Seth Godin or wherever, and I've heard pastors preach this, you know, where's this bus headed sermon over the years. And the problem is you wait for people to get on the bus and find out where they want to go. You don't have enough buses. You just have to say, this is our bus, and this is where we're headed. And if it's somewhere you want to go to, then there's a seat for you. But it's hard to come to that conclusion that you're not trying to just reach everybody. And that somewhere along the way, some will fall off. And by, (laughs) if you've been here for 10 years, you've seen that. It's not for everybody. We get it. And for various reasons, so I don't want to imply that everybody who's not here now, it was because of that, some some moves for all kinds of different reasons. But my point is this, the hardest part is to realize this is not for everybody. 
You know, we are convinced, and I've said it many times here, I think I even said it last week, at renovation, we are convinced that when people reach a point where they realize with conviction that the power and authority they walk in has no rival because the God they serve has no rival, but they begin to act different. They begin to live different. They're changed. And what's so awesome about what we believe in true Christianity, we do not use that power to manipulate, lord over other people. We use that power to serve them to advance the kingdom. And so one of the hardest parts about leading a church is saying, this is what we're going to try to do. You know, we look at a time, like for me, over the last two years in trying to lead the church through COVID and the confusion that's in our culture today or the I don't know what you want to call it, the chaos seems like in the rift that's between extremes. You know, I ask myself a question sometimes, and I don't know if it makes sense or not, but 10 years from now, what's the story we want to tell about what's happened the last two years? And I'm not sure the story I want to tell 10 years from now, which I hope I tell the truth, is exactly what I as I look back on it now, I wished it happened. Because I wish now as I look back, I wish the story I could tell 10 years from now is, yeah, we tried to go with the guidelines of the government with everything, but one thing we didn't do, we didn't withdraw. We didn't say, hey, let's just put everything else on hold. Hey, somehow or another, we decided right now is the time just to shut everything else down. No, we should have been saying it's time to grow. That's the story I wish I could tell, but I can't. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Oh, we're going into a more of a split, messed up culture, man. You've got you, this is we're a divide. The church really has no role because they can't really speak into it. Oh, we're going into a recession. I love what Zig Ziglar said years ago. He said the last three recessions, we voted not to participate. And I believe in so many ways we as a church have got to make a decision. We don't, we're not going to buy into the fear. Fool me once, but fool me twice. I hope the story is, is, is 10 years from now, when I'm 72 years old, the Lord allows me to live that long. I hope the story told about this church is that they stepped into the mess. They took their ropes and expanded their tents. Oh, yeah, they drew their tent pegs deep. They weren't blown here and there by every wind and doctrine. They weren't blown here and there by every crisis that came. They weren't blown here every time. Oh, well, you didn't say this or you didn't. They weren't blown and changing and trying to fit everybody on the bus because the bus that he may have for us is not for everybody. What if they said 10 years from now, that was when the time they stepped out and all of a sudden there was a, there was a uh, satellite of Renovation Church in the East Valley. There's one in South Phoenix because they believed what they were doing was worth duplicating somewhere else. They believed the message that God had put in their heart was worth doing somewhere else. Not because there's not a good church there, but what God had put in their heart, the bus they're driving is worth it. But here's the hard part, right? That means all of us wouldn't be together all the time. That means the people in this room would not go to the same church all the time. But when you're looking to a vision of what God is laying out, that means that I won't live in Texarkana all my life where my mom and dad can see their grandkids every week. And where I buried both my parents from a distance, like many of you have. But when God says, clear the ground, when God says, it's time to spread the tents, 
Those are important things. My parents, my siblings, five siblings. Now, have I been intentional to make sure my kids stayed close to all of them? Yes. Had to make some adjustments. Maybe some ways they're close to them if we'd stayed there <laughs> in some ways. Because we were very intentional. I'm not saying it's perfect, but we were intentional. When God begins to make change, there's hard parts. I didn't say this morning. What yours is or what mine is particularly. You probably already know what it is. Why is it so hard to make change? I think there's a lot of reasons. Fear. Lack of margin. I mean, there's a lot of reasons our lives are so cluttered that we don't have room for anything else. And that's the reason why the scripture says make room. It's time to make room. It's time to, as John, a uh, Jake, John Acuff in his book, Quitter, it's time to quit some things. It's time to, you know, where, where you're going, where God's taking you, where God's taking this church, there's certain things you can't take with you. Just can't take it with you. Sometimes we don't change it because we're hard-hearted and hard-headed. Know anybody like that? We've just made the decision. I know I need to change. But worse than even stubborn is your heart's hard. You've just hardened your heart to God doing what only God can do in your life. You've hardened your heart. Oh, you're still attending church, but you've made a decision, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. <laughs> I call you to a radical life change, Paul says. I'm not moving. Did you see something not fitting there? Something's not. And what did Paul say? Everything you needed to hear, every encouragement, every word of truth, I gave it to you. You got it. You know, there is a point. Let me say this the right way. I want to try to make sure I couch my words right. There is a point where my responsibility ends as your pastor. There's a point where my responsibility ends. And that responsibility is that I came to you. Sorry about camera. But I, those online, uh, but I came to you with truth and encouragement, and that, there's a point that that ends, and your time, it's your time to pick it up. I'm not carrying that for you anymore. Yeah, this bus won't be for everybody, right? Or you've made up your mind, you're the exception to change. Either one way or another, I don't have to make a change, but maybe you do. Or I've tried to change, and I keep stumbling, and I can't get there. What's our phrase around here? Don't give up. Get up. When you stumble and you trip, again, when you stumble and trip, if I do that and I hit the ground, what's the first thing I'm going to do if I'm going to have good sense? Jump up and see if anybody else saw me, right? That's the first thing. But the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look and see what tripped me. And why do I want to see what tripped me? Is so I won't trip over it again, but guess what? I don't want anybody following me to trip over it because I'm planning on leading people. I'm planning on being an influence for the kingdom, and I want to make sure what I'm tripping over needs to get removed so nobody else will come behind me and trip over it either the best I can help.
I am a avid hiker, as most of you know, or many of you know, avid, I don't know what that is, avid in my mind, maybe not in yours. But one of the things that I just said I'm never going to do is use a hiking pole. You know why I don't use a hiking pole? Because for old people. I'm not kidding. That's what my thoughts are. I'm telling you, that's the truth. That's how I look at it. Until I went on a hike up at Christopher Creek not too long ago. Show the first slide if you've got it. And the trail's right there. And there's all this tall grass. And about the time we started going in this tall grass, I saw this little young lady just crying. See, I bought, I, I know this sounds bad. I bought these. <laughs> It's going to sound terrible. I bought these sticks for Jan. Okay, okay, that's it. <laughs> but the last time she went hike, we went hiking, she tripped and broke her wrist. So we, we got sticks, okay. But anyway, so we're walking along this trust, beautiful trust, Sea Canyon, uh, Canyon Springs up in Christopher Creek. And we're going along. We're about to go through this area here. And there's something I never have really on my mind at all. And I see this little, like, 10-year-old girl over here crying. And she's just bawling. And her mom's holding her. And I, and I just kind of like, I, you know, I try not to get involved. I actually, so I was trying not to get involved. <laughs> and, and I had a hard enough time raising my own three girls. So I didn't want to raise somebody else's there all of a sudden. And she goes, did you see the black snake back there? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why the little girl was crying. She said it was a black rattlesnake. I'm like, black rattlesnake? I ain't never seen a black rattlesnake. I've seen. So we went, and I told Jen, give me your stick. <laughs> so as we went through that grass, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> Cleaning that grass out. And then two days later, I go, and there it is. I'm cruising along and I'm going fast, and there is that black rouse. I've never seen one before. And after I saw it, and after it's two two times I've been on that trail, there's a black rattlesnake. I had a choice, right? Punt. Either neither go on that, never go on that trail again. Or get the tools you need to go on the trail and don't let that snake stop you. So after all these years, almost every hike you're going to see me now with an old man stick. Okay? I've changed. I'm a changed man. I've taken on new stuff. The stigma that went with it, I thought, didn't apply to me. But matter of fact, it does. Thousands of miles I've hiked. Thousands and thousands, probably, in all these years. Never had a stick. Things are going to come that you're going to have to adjust to. Things are going to come that you're going to pick up new tools that you need to take. There's going to be changes you're going to have to make in your life that you're going to have to come to some real hard truth. And some of them are, and one of the hardest ones I think is, if I make this change, I don't see results fast enough. Let me flip that over. If I don't make the change, I don't see the consequences fast either of not making the change. thought about this you know I've been overweight at times and sometimes way more than I need to be and I hate to harp on that it's just my deal I mean I've got an addiction to sugar and uh, when you're married to Jan that's brutal okay because she doesn't know how to not make things that are good and tasty but one of the pictures I've got in my mind about my joints after I had my hip replaced was if I don't lose this 20-25 pounds which I did because I like hiking it's like doing this to my knees and my joints. Every time I take a step, unnecessary, unnecessary, no reason to be carrying it, no reason to be doing it, and it finally dawned on me, I got to make a change. 
Because if I walked around that way, hitting myself in the, sh- in the knee and hitting my hip with a hammer, you'd go, dude, I think you need to stop that. I don't think that's a good plan. It's because the consequence of whatever it is, and you take your own thing, the consequence is not immediate enough. So you don't change. You think that somehow or another the decisions you make today have no impact on tomorrow. I mean, I love what Andy Stanley says, principle of the pathway. And you've heard me mention a thousand times here. But, but, but the concept of this, whatever road you own takes you where it takes you. You can't say that I want to follow after Jesus with all my heart and, and say this is the road and keep walking this way. You're not ever going to get there. So you begin to have to make choices and changes and ask God to begin to reveal things in your mind and your heart. And get yourself in community where they'll hold you accountable. Because we believe in the radical life change, not just for change's sake. We believe in the radical optimism. that It's more than just getting into heaven. It's more than just escaping hell. It's more than just getting a new group of people to hang out with. It literally changes your life and changes generations. Cultures. Clear the land. Clear the land. We need to identify what changes need to happen. But when you do it, I want to ask you to do this. Write a sentence out beside it of why you believe it needs to be a change. The why, what will inform you? Why will inspire you? One of the biggest things we can do as a church is to do the best we can, as we said last week. Try to make the best situation for the things that only God can do can happen. We're never going to try to do, never going to try to compete with God and try to do what only God can do. But we do hope we can give you circumstances and places that you got a better shot at it. August 27th, we're going to have something here called Empowered. Saturday morning from about 8.15 to noon. And it's just challenging you and giving you little bits of sitting around tables and getting information about leadership and influence. We'll have child care. but I think you need to make it a priority. Need to make room. Need to make room. It's in the email, I'm sure, and you'll get more information over the next week or so. But one of the biggest challenges, I think for most of us, is really identifying the hard part. I can tell you the hardest part for me to keep weight off, and I'm just, I, I stay on that because it's, it's just the, my b- biggest challenge, and I know I'm active often and all that kind of stuff, but it's a challenge for me. I'm just confessing. My biggest hard part is in the evening. I literally can go almost all day without eating. That by the time I get to 5 or 6 o'clock, I can clean the fridge and pantry out. <laughs> and I used to get by with that when I was 25, 26. Well, until Jane got pregnant, then I couldn't get by with it. Well, that and the fact that she was making fried bologna sandwiches that I was eating like three at a time. But that's beside the point. I even eat better now. And it's still a challenge. But I want to ask you a question. What is that one change right now that's in your mind? That if you made it and you committed yourself to it, you believe it could transform things. That God is showing you if you'll make this change, you'll make this decision, 
and you will stick with it with my help and maybe other tools that you may need to get. It is like a rock being thrown in a pond. That one rock will begin to change other things. And those other things won't get changed until that one rock's thrown in. Where God's taking us, the thing that keeps over the last few days in my mind, of what God wants to do as Renovation Church, one of the big questions is, what's the hard part? <laughs> Let's identify the hard part. Let's get that out up front. That's like good news, bad news. That's not that to me. There's going to be a hard part. Let's address it. I need to address it 5 o'clock on. I'm <laughs> just saying if I want to get, that's just, and, and not counting my blood sugar and all the other things that go with that. I need to address it. I know it's the hard part. You go, well, that's not very spiritual. I guarantee you it is. Because when I have brain fog because I'm eating too late at night and now my body's having to metabolize that all night when it shouldn't have to and I get up in the morning and I'm not rested, guess what? I'm not as sharp as I need to be for the kingdom. I'm doing confessional here and trying to make myself accountable. We'll see if it works. Uh, Because there's a hard part. What's the hard part about hiking for me? Oh, it's not going 10 miles or whatever. That's not the the hard part for me. It's getting on the, the trail. If I'm on the trail, the 10 miles is easy. It's just getting up and getting on the trail. It's a decision that's made. Because I believe with all my heart. You'll say, you guys can come on up. I believe with all my heart that each of us have a responsibility to the rest of us. Can I say that again? Okay, y'all give me permission to say it again? Each of us in here. That does not say, Paul doesn't say, and I know he's speaking to leaders there, but I'm, I'm just assuming I'm speaking to leaders here. I challenged you and encouraged you, and I gave you the best that I knew to give you to a radical life change. He didn't just say, hey, pastors, you do that so everybody else can, you get up here on a Sunday morning and set yourself on fire and people come and watch you burn. That's not what is said. said to each of us individually and I do believe each of us in here who wants to be on the bus that renovation is trying the direction the place we're trying to go has a responsibility to everybody else on the bus to do the best they can to be the best version of who God's created them to be it is your responsibility to the rest of us Because there's parts of this you're not going to outsource to anybody else. It's absolutely not going to happen. Quit thinking it is. It's not. You cannot outsource it. Now, you may need to go get help to help you work through it. That's not what I'm saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. You actually may have to have coaches or or counseling and all those things. Christian is, is what I would recommend. Those who are committed to the same place we're trying to take you to, which is radical life change. You may need help to get there. But that's still not outsourcing it. You have to make the phone call. You have to show up for the appointment. You have to do the homework when you leave. What would this place look like if all of us were committed to make room for change for this radical life change called Christianity that this old world is desperately they're they're not interested in watching us gather on Sunday morning that does not impress them actually they may kind of go that's weird what they are interested in is that fragrance and aroma of our Lord Jesus Christ showing up at work showing up at the ball field showing up in the schools 
Because when it's good news for you, and it always is, it's good news for them too. Would you stand with me? Thank you for hanging in there with me. Josiah and I are going to lead us. We do it a few ways around here. One is you can, obviously, we don't pressure anybody to come up front. One of the awesome things about being a part of the Church of the Nazarene is we've kept these altars. It is a place that's already been used today, which I love seeing. But it's a place to come and just surrender. And make a promise, as we said last week. Make room for a promise. Make room for change. Clear the ground. What is it right now that you may need to clear out? But what you need to say once and for all here, and then you need to tell somebody else to hold you accountable to it. Lord, help us right now. As we know one decision, one decision can change the direction of a family. One one decision, yes, it's had ripple, but one decision can affect generations. Hundreds in our own lives, hopefully hundreds of teenagers, maybe thousands of teenagers over the years. Lord, one decision. But Lord, we're one person. The the room this size, what could that mean for the advancement of the kingdom? Lord, we, in our minds and I pray in our hearts, that we believe what you have called us to is a radical life change. Yes, uncommon. And a radical trust in you. Help us be the people you have called us to be. For your glory, the impact on our community, and the betterment of us. Because we know that's the only way to live. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. You come if you feel led.